Okay, welcome divas and dudes to Powerhouse Bakery, the final, final, final class at 4902 Golden Quail. So no tears, because it'll make me sad too. Um, so it's just a new chapter for us all. And um, thank you so much for making it. Um, gosh, so many great years and lots of fun. And so today what I wanted to do um, was one, uh, let you show off some of your knowledge. And number two, maybe teach you something new. But for sure, um, you guys are not novices when it comes to looking at nutrition labels. So there's a few things I want to be able to share with you, but for the most part, I want you to just get to celebrate how much you know from all the classes that we've done, right? Um, and what I always say is, I mean, I learn every day, so I want to make sure that um, I pass that interest and, and excitement on that we get to learn new things all the time, especially when it comes to nutrition because the label is in constant flux it's under so much pressure it's under pressure because the health and wellness industry wants to help us but they also want to do what make money so the health and wellness industry and of course the food manufacturing industry is huge and so that's going to have a big pull on what we see on our labels and then, of course, the government um, wants to make sure they're protecting us because, you know, maybe we're not smart enough to know on our own. So we're going to need the government to tell us what is healthy and what is not and what sh we should focus on as far as nutrition and what sh we should not worry about. And so all of that, I think, is really up for discussion. You know, how come, why is it that only a few things are put on the nutrition label? Well, somebody has made that decision. And so I hope that as the generations evolve and our, our knowledge evolves, um, we can be a grassroots effort to help encourage other information to be on the label because ultimately it's for our health. It's for our short-term enjoyment of food, um, for the safety of the food, but also for, you know, how do we avoid disease? How do we meet our basic nutritional parameters? And so when we think about how incredibly important the nutrition label is, um, it's something that should be thought of with lots of um, participation. The consumer needs to have a say in it. Um, I don't know if any of you watch Tucker Carlson, but it just made me think of his whole idea that, you know, we need to be a voice. We need to have, we need to have awareness of what information is given to us in the news and media. Same thing with food. We need to be aware of what information is not given to us, just like in the news. And so in the world of nutrition, I hope that I can really empower you guys to ask good questions, look beyond what's in the label information, and really take it up with those that can make a difference, that can help us decide what's going to go in the label and what isn't. Uh, the Center for Science and the Public Interest is one of those grassroots um, pretty powerful lobbyists, honestly. They've been around for many years. Anybody remember what CSPI, the Center for Science and the Public Interest, was able to do on labels? They were able to get trans fats on the label. That was something that was tucked under the rug, right? The food industry loved being able to use trans fats because it helped with stability, it helped with flavor, um, it was really cheap. And the Center for Science and the Public Interest was able to really change what fats were talked about. And then once it got on the label, then what happened? People were taught that that was something to avoid. And so now it's not even in foods anymore. How cool is that? There's another food that's similar to this. Anybody know? It's a, it's a sugar. It's a sweetener. It's liquidy. It's put in so many things. It's on the... Yes! Good job! You guys, again, you know so much. High fructose corn syrup was another one that was nicely packed into foods all the time. Every kind of food had high fructose corn syrup added because it was cheap. It made it taste good. And it was a great way to stabilize foods. You guys have heard my term, food cocaine, right? <laughs> high fructose corn syrup is one of those. because we, we know we like high fat, high salt, high sweet. And then we also like high crunch. We like finger foods. 
The Dorito is an amazing food I told you about in many classes, and it kind of makes me all, all of us chuckle, I think, that uh, at UC Davis, I spent an entire quarter uh, at, at you know the college level learning about all of the thought that went into that chip. And high fructose corn syrup is a leading ingredient that helps people go, oh my gosh, that's so good, I must have more. Um, and in my travels, I, I had to go to Florida, had to, oh darn, had to go to a wedding on the beach this weekend. And um, I was in the airport and I was forced to eat the, the pretzels and the cookie because that's all they give you now. And of course, what did I do? I looked on the label and there was something new on the label that is just as of 2020. Anybody want to guess? Genetically engineered foods. We knew, we talked about this, uh, I think it was last spring. We talked about it coming and that again on food labels, the genetically engineered foods was going to start to show. So it used to be called GMO, genetically modified organisms, but it's sort of changed and that's because so many grassroots organizations are warning us that GMOs are bad. They're bad, you don't want them, don't get foods with them. And then there's another side of the coin that talks about genetic modification saying, there's no science that says it's bad for us. So again, there's this really interesting topic that we get to vote on. And so um, what I wanted to do today was just kind of outline some of the things that we learn on a food label. Things that are, have been around for a long time, like how many grams of fat, how many you know, milligrams of sodium, and then even things that are brand new. And we're going to learn how the food industry is presenting it to people. And knowing that some of this information is very um, worrisome. So just like the trans fats and the high fructose corn syrup, now we've got the genetically modified foods that are starting to make people wonder, ask questions, and finally vote with their dollar. Okay? So um, what I want to do first is I want to pass out some foods for you to be able to look at. And you're going to, it's going to be a working class because I'm going to ask you what information to find. Just for a few moments here, we're going to look through the labels. And if I didn't get enough for everybody, forgive me. We'll share it. Okay, share it. We'll share it. Let's see. This is kind of heavy. So you can just look at it for a minute and then you can put it down. You got your big fancy chair too. Okay, everybody got one at least? Or sharing with somebody? Okay, so when you shop, what's the first thing you do? You see something on the shelf that, you know, you're looking for. You bring it to you and you flip it around, right? We flip it around. What's in it? Right? So what's the first thing you look for? You probably are going to look for what we've been trained to look for, which is how many calories, right? Calories, sugars, and carbs. Calories, sugars, and carbs, yes. Um, and so if we're looking for calories, sugar, grams, what do we need to first understand? If we're looking for calories, grams, of sugars, maybe carbs, proteins. What other information do we have to make sure we know of? Serving. Yes, exactly, the serving size. And quite often when you look at a product, um, it will have multiple servings. Now, even on the airplane when I had those little pretzel, it was only one serving, but um, quite often things that are appearing to be one serving will actually have a few. So good, that's exactly one thing we want to watch out for is the serving. Um, th the other thing that we want to understand is when we're looking at grams of sugars versus carbs, um, if you look at your Greek yogurt and your coconut yogurt, um, tell me if you see grams of sugar in the yogurt. The six grams. Yeah. Six, grams. Six, six grams of sugars? Six grams of sugar and they have five servings in the container. Okay. Total of 
So something that's important is when we're looking at some products, the sugars might be part of the carbohydrates, right? And what food is notorious for this? The dairy products, right? Because lactose is milk sugar. So it's really confusing if you're looking at a, um, a yogurt that has carbohydrates and then it also has sugars. So how do you differentiate? What's the next thing you look at to get some more information? If you see that um, the, the yogurt, let's just use this as an example. Yeah, say, say the carbs are 16 grams and the, the sugars are 5 grams. Well, we know that those sugars are part of the carbohydrates. Now, the way to make sure, if you're looking for a product that has no sugar added, where can we find that information? Exactly. So that's something new in the label. They're going to tell you on that label how many added grams of sugar. And where else can you look? Where else might you find the information? In the ingredients. Yes! Ingredients, which is on our little notes here. So nutrition facts, and then number four is ingredients. So the ingredients will ultimately give us the great information for, okay, what is in it, right? And so I love that you thought of ingredients. So it's nice that the labeling is trying to make it easier, added sugars. Now, who has the maple syrup, the organic maple syrup? Okay. Right? <laughs> the maple syrup is so good. And it's been getting sort of a bad rap because even though it's, tell us how many grams of sugar in okay. your maple syrup. The serving size is two tablespoons. Okay. And there put, are 24 grams total sugars. Two tablespoons, 24 grams of total sugars. And how many grams of carbs? 27. So how do we get 27 grams of carbs when there's also some sugars? What, what can we deduce from that? Maybe. We could look at the ingredient list and see if they've added. Good thinking. Check our ingredient list and see if there's uh, any added sugar in that. Pure maple syrup. Right? So those numbers are always going to have some equivocation. Just like with the lactose and that's the milk sugar. So when you have a one ingredient food, can we trust the ingredient that, okay, it's just maple syrup? And we, and we can now make this, this question mark less important, right? Because, well, it doesn't make sense. Now we can, we can now guess, because we're all very astute to all this, what could you guess might have fallen into the carb category to give it a few extra grams? I think it is 15 to 20% variability in it. Yes, Seema. Yes. So variability. There's actually, um, it's, it's okay to have a 20% variance. That's a lot. <laughs> right? Variability. But also, there's some fiber. There's some fiber that would count in the carbs. So... SEMA could be absolutely right. There could just be some variability. In, and you would hope that um, that would be cross-checked, that somebody would go, okay, well, let's at least make these match. So perhaps um, no eyes actually caught that. More likely, it's representing some fiber. Also because every batch is not checked for each and every ingredient. So this is very expensive to run. So it is just... Okay, we prepared it in such a way, and this is what we did once scientifically, but every time they prepare a batch, they will be very good. And so for sure, there's going to be some wiggle room. And so how do we as consumers um, prioritize where we get the information and then be confident that what we're seeing is, is correct? So those couple of grams there, three grams, I'm going to say probably some oligosaccharides because it's a one ingredient food so they couldn't have ha added something yeah now maybe one tree is going to be a little sweeter than another <laughs> i don't uh, know it says it takes 35 gallons of sugar maple tree sap to make one gallon wow oh, it's expensive. Uh, 35 uh, gallons from the tree itself to then uh, probably cook it down to make the maple syrup yeah 
So thank you for that. And so for sure, we understand that there'll be some variability and we know how to prioritize. The first thing we're going to look at is what's the serving size. And then we're going to look at what macronutrient are we most concerned about. And making it easy means that we get foods with very few ingredients. And so as we go through our list, the Nutrition Facts panel gives us the macros. The call-out label is going to have all kinds of things on it. So now I want all of you to flip it to the front and let's look at some of the call-outs or the, um, you know, the front label information. And so we're going to say front of pack. That's kind of the industry terms to make it sound all official. And so call out some of the things that you see on your front of pack. Non-GMO. Non-GMO, okay. Live probiotics. Live probiotics. USDA organic. USDA organic. Okay, so we've got organic. And so the non-GMO, interesting, there's two ways to describe this. If it has a bioengineered ingredient, they use that terminology. If it doesn't have it, they call it non-GMO. I think that's an interesting subtlety. And like on the pretzels and the cookie that I had from the airport, or the airplane actually, um, in the fine print down below, it said contains trace amounts of bioengineered ingredients. Now, interesting that beet sugar does have some bioengineered foods, but when something is sweetened with beet sugar, because it's so highly processed, there's no more detectable or trace amounts left, so they don't have to put it in there. So where you read non-GMO, we don't know if it started out with an ingredient that actually had genetically modified ingredient in it, but it got processed out. Interesting, right? What are some of the things that you see on your front of pack? Dairy-free and vegan. All right. So dairy-free, vegan. Any other? So these are called lifestyle phrases. So you eat dairy-free and you eat vegan and you eat keto. So anybody have anything that says... 17 grams of protein, zero milk fat. Yeah. So they're calling out... And Seema's is calling out you to double check your nutrition facts panel. It's directing you back to the panel because that's its, its flag that it's waving. And sometimes it'll say heart healthy. Anybody have one that says that? That's because this little phrase became a little harder to use. The American Heart Association, so here's the wellness community saying, you know what, it's going to have to follow some very strict guidelines to get to put that one on there. Uh, anybody have one that says keto friendly? No? Soy free. Soy free. Okay. Soy free. Mine says RBST. I don't know what that is. Yeah. R B S. What was it again? R B in lowercase and S T in uppercase. Yeah. So this is a hormone. Thank you, Mary, for checking that. Um, the added hormones that are really at the crux of the fear around dairy products. And that's a really good point because that's called a red herring. When they mention that, it's really moot because they don't have any amount. They, they, this isn't in milks at all. Now, the difference between organic milk and milks that say this is really so subtle. The animals that are raised to be organic have to follow a very specific diet, very specific according to organics. But by another law, we cannot have this hormone in the milk. So call it a red herring because they're telling you something that's irrelevant. It's kind of like another one. Uh, if any of you have the peanut butter or the nut butter, and it'll say a cholesterol-free food. Did, did peanuts or uh, sunflower seeds ever have cholesterol in them? No. no. So why would they put that on there? Because they're hoping that you have been taught somewhere that cholesterol is bad. Yeah, it says it on that one. Yeah. Now, in some cases, perhaps cholesterol could find its way into some peanut butters if they've added some, some saturated fat. So I guess it's possible that that might have happened. But the peanuts, 
the sunflower seeds, the almonds never had cholesterol. So putting that on the front of the pack is very misleading. Um, anybody else have another call out on the front? Maybe anything like all natural? Ours is alternative. Alternative? Plant-based. Oh, oh. Yogurt yes, yogurt alternative. Okay, that's another great one. Gluten-free. Right. So, so let's do this one first. The gluten-free and the soy-free, those are definitely appealing to a very specific population. Now, the manufacturers know that they run a risk putting that on their food because there's going to be some people that go, ooh, I don't want that just because it says that on there. So they're appealing to a very small niche of people. Um, and same thing with the soy free. And the, now what's interesting is vegan is starting to really grow in popularity. Um, even some of the stores like HEB are starting to have their own section. But I tell you, for about a year and a half, they really struggled with where to put vegan cheese. They tried to get into the brain of people to think, okay, where are they going to look for it? Are we going to look for it with all the other cheeses or do we give it its very own spot? Have you noticed that? Yeah, it, has it does now, and it didn't used to. And some stores still kind of flux, you know, as far as where they put it. So again, it's the it's the wellness uh, influence that they're trying to understand. They're trying to get into the brains of the people to see where can we put it. How do we how do we create the front of the label so that it helps you with the information that matters to you. And so they they get it that gluten free is really starting to be important. Yes. Almost is natural. So yeah. how crucial? Oh. I love it. That's such a good question. So let's talk about natural. Um, we are assuming that natural is good. We're we're living on the assumption that single ingredient foods are good. That if we don't have it too processed, that means it's better. Is there anything that we should be worried about when it just says natural? Maybe. I mean, cyanide's natural. Do we want that in our, <laughs> right? So not everything natural means good. In fact, um, you know, quite often people are worried about uh, dangerous chemicals in beans. Well, the beans, if you ate them natural, meaning not cooked, so natural or raw, you could have lectins build up in your system and get quite sick. So I only bring this up because it's such a vague term. So we, we don't want to give it a lot of clout. Um, people will often say, well, it's all natural. It must be good. And that's not necessarily true. This says oil separation occurs naturally. Yes. So. Yes. Right. So when you grind up a nut, you're going to have the heavy components separate from the lighter components. So the solids and the oil separate. And so they're trying to warn the customer that this is okay. And we know that generations that grew up on Skippy, if they looked at that one, they would think, oh my gosh, I don't want all that fat. And they might pour it out. And then what's left would be dry and tasteless. Mm -hmm. But does Skippy have any improvements on it? Not really. What do you think Skippy has added that's prevented the separation? Yes, hydrogenated oils. Sometimes now they're doing a little better and using a palm oil, which is natural, but it's still added fat. So in my opinion, we would rather not have any added fat to our already high fat nut butter. So in that case, the all natural um, could ne is not necessarily better. Um, because if they are adding a palm shortening to make it stable. For example, there's a, I think one of you might have it, the, there's a sun butter out there and a, and a cashew butter. Yes, yeah, so uh, read the label for us there, Rachel, and see if you say it naturally separates or not. It's another one, though, that has, yeah, you look in the ingredient list and see if you can find the, Right. So, so temperature now is helping prevent that natural separation. They, and so check in the ingredient list for me. They haven't added any fat, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Saturated smells brilliant. So it's trans. So, trans zero. Got it. So trans are the ones that are added fat that we know are bad. So good, zero. We know that it does have some naturally occurring saturated fats, not cholesterol like an animal, right? But it has some saturated fats. Um, and so the good news is it's refrigerated to prevent the separating. They didn't add another fat to it. And so we, how do we find that information? The front of pack is going to give us a little bit of the information. And then we go to the ingredients to get more information. And that's because we're savvy. The, the uneducated customer might read the front and just get all their information there. And they might read the front and go to the nutrition facts panel and miss the ingredients list. And so that's where I'm trying to help us see that all components are really valuable. So the front of pack callouts um, are trying to really look at your health interests. And they're really trying to help sell to the individual, whatever your, you know, interests are. So again, if you have been told by your doctor that you need to eat low fat and your product is telling you low fat on the front, where can you go? Yeah, where can you go to double check what low fat or um, the right kinds of fats? But as you said one time, they can put like zero trans because they've made the serving size smaller. Yes, that's so smart, Shirley. And so there again, it's good at getting several components that help you make your best decision. And just like Seema said, there's a 20% variance. So, you know, there's some vagueness, both in the portion size and in what the label's really gonna tell us. But for the most part, the front panel is trying to tell you something about the product. It's trying to call an individual um, technique. So whether you are looking for a soy-free product because you have an allergy, and of course, if you have a, a gluten allergy. Um, but it always helps when you're looking at front label that you want to cross check by looking at ingredients to get more information. And of course, the nutrition facts panel helps a little bit. But you know, interesting, the nutrition facts panel um, doesn't tell us about phytoestrogens, about antioxidants, right? Where do we find that information? You don't. Online. Yeah, online, right? <laughs> Google. And so there's the, the smoking gun of, you know, the, the food label can't really give us all the information. And so that's where your food knowledge becomes so valuable. And so when we're looking for uh, a healthy food to put on our best foods list, um, Sometimes it doesn't even help to look at the label. Sometimes it helps just to know the food, right? So if we're looking for a mayonnaise and we know we need to have a mayonnaise, we're going to do a recipe and we want to have it. Our options might be to substitute it out, maybe use olive oil or maybe use a better mayonnaise. You know, I love to teach you how to go from good to great. And so this Ojai Cook is one that I love because it goes from good to great. It's still a mayonnaise, but it has really good ingredients. And so the front of pack doesn't give us a lot of information. It says it's gluten-free. Does that matter with a mayonnaise? No. Does any mayonnaise have gluten? I can't find one. I've never heard of such a thing because it's mainly fats, right? Um, it has no GMO. And it, it doesn't say anything about a bioengineered food. It uses the... So this little group called um, Non-GMO Verified is a grassroots organization that tries to get all genetic modified foods out of the food uh, supply. So what is that name? It's called the Ojai Cook, O-J-A-I. O-J-A-I. And it's... Question, is it to be found with the Yes. Yeah, see, now we're going to get into the brain of the of H-E-B. Where do we put this stuff? And yes, it's I find it with the other mayonnaises. Um, it says number one in taste. To use, right? I think it is. Now let's decide what makes it healthy. Yeah. So I looked at the front of pack, real flavored mayonnaise. So real mayonnaise. Okay. That means it's going to have eggs and what, what makes mayonnaise? Eggs and oil. So even, even, uh, you know, the lay person might not know what real mayonnaise means. Um, what's the one that has all the sugar added to it? Miracle Whip. Yeah. Miracle Whip. Is that real? <laughs> right? Because it has all kinds of 
other ingredients. So we had to know that the fewer ingredients means it's better, right, with the word real. Real is very vague. What does real mean? We know, because you're smart, that it means um, fewer ingredients. Miracle Whip, anybody want to Google it, might have maybe two grams. So somebody check it out for me. So case in point, it's again a red herring. All mayonnaises are going to be low in carbohydrate, whether they're real or not. They still have to be low in carbohydrate. Otherwise, they're not going to spread on your sandwich, <laughs> right? Calories. How much did the Miracle Whip have as far as carbohydrates? Uh, 40 calories. Three point five grams of fat per serving. What does that say about sugar? Miracle Whip has. Tell me that again for the. I can write it down for everybody to see. Um, Miracle Whip contains. Or it says it contains fewer calories and fat than Kraft Mayonnaise. The product contains forty calories. Okay, forty calories. Mm -hmm. One tablespoon. Well, let me see, and 3.5 grams of fat per serving. Per serving. Okay, oh, this is going to be good. And how many grams of sugar or, or carbs? It doesn't tell me. Oh. Just Google the medical with nutritional. Yeah, see if you can find it. This will be such a great example of case in point, right? Because somebody might look at the Miracle Whip, even with the information we have, and think, well, gosh, it's lower in calories. Why don't I just have it? I found the link. Okay, good. Tell us. What else did you find? Um, How many grams of carbs? Two grams. Two, two, grams. two grams of carbs. All right. And one gram of sugar. One gram of sugar. All right. 130 milligrams of sodium. 130 millig milligrams of sodium, not that much. One gram added sugar. Okay, and how many grams of fat? It should be right at the top. Oh, total fat, 1.5 grams. So this must be a, this must not be real mayonnaise. This is 3.5, I would say. Because look at this. If it were real mayonnaise, wouldn't it have to be mainly fat? So it's Miracle Whip, which is a sandwich spread, I think they call it, right? So it becomes really muddy, kind of like with the yogurts that you're all holding. You know, if it's a yogurt alternative, um, that phrasing seems to be acceptable in yogurts. Would, do you think that Kraft would be called a mayonnaise alternative? No, way too complicated because Miracle Whip has gotten its own familiarity. And so interesting that the calories are lower. And so if somebody says, well, what's the best mayonnaise? And I would say this one. And they would say, well, based on what? That has a lot more calories. My goodness, this one has 110. In one tablespoon? Uh-huh. And so I wouldn't be basing my decision on it being healthy based on calories. What would I be basing it on? Ingredients. Ingredients. Yes. If I'm going to get a mayonnaise, it's a fat. So now I'm going to go to my best foods list. And on my best foods list, I'm going to look at fats. And I'm using it as a real fat, so I want it to be really good fatty acids. I don't want something that's going to have uh, diet sugars or high fructose corn syrup or stuff in it, right? We want simple ingredients, real, I guess is what we'd have to figure. But for the most part, it had to take a real detective to figure out why we would call this one healthier than the Miracle Whip. So interesting. Now, what about, you know, because Kraft makes all, a lot of mayonnaise. It makes the re just the regular standard Kraft mayonnaise, but then it has the one that's made with olive oil, and then it yeah. has the one that's made with canola oil. So for years, I've been buying, because I like, I like mayonnaise. Yes. I've been buying the one with canola oil, because way right back in the Yeah, canola was considered good. Sure, sure. So what's the difference with the canola oil and the olive oil and then just the standard real mayonnaise? There's so many ways to look at that. So many elements. I know I was almost going to. So this whole element of which one. 
And that's why I love talking about the labels. So when we think of which one, there's all these components that are going to help Rachel decide what's better. Um, and if we're looking at the question of what, what um, mayonnaise is best, and it's canola, oil, or olive, or low calorie, like, right? Or fewer ingredients. And that's where it's so fun to start really being a label detective. And it's just not enough to look at the nutrition facts panel. Um, fewer ingredients. So let's go down this path. And um, I love how this topic has taken on a life of its own because it really, it matters to all of us, you know, to think about how do we decide. Canola oil used to be considered a better oil than it's some. Oil. Right. And now because canola has become a lot more genetically modified. So it's one of those plants that doesn't really occur in nature. It's a hybrid. And so it has some fears around it. And I'm really trying to say this carefully because I'm not convinced that genetic modification is bad. We've been modifying plants. I think I told you I graduated from UC Davis. So it's very much like uh, A&M where agricultural uh, research is huge. And farmers have been modifying their crops for thousands of years. And so we don't want to jump to a conclusion because of fear mongering. Now, granted, there are some things that we still need to study, but let's say that, you know, what was important about our decision on which one to get would be that we wanted no GMOs. Then we have to decide, well, maybe olive oil is better. Now, not to say there aren't a lot of questions around olive oil too, but when we start learning new information, we have to put some other thing in here. So when we find that genetic modification is starting to be an issue, and we might be able to see in our mayonnaise if it has contains trace amounts of genetic engineering or genetically engineered or bioengineered. There's a couple different phrasing. But it didn't used to say that because before 2020, there did not need to be any information on the food that warned us of this issue. So now canola oil is starting to be a focus because we're learning that it has some genetic modification in it. You follow it? So we might have to change what we're using for our mayonnaise because of our fear of genetic modification. Or the other way to look at it is, hmm, I only eat mayonnaise twice a month. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to eat the one I have that I like. Done. There's bigger fish to fry. Because... I think when it really comes down to it, our goal is to eat foods that don't have food labels, right? It's like, what a concept. These are things that have a lot of manufacturing around it. And what I want to do when I get to be with you guys in July is really delve into, again, um, what's happening with our farming practices. I did a lot of this I think it was in 2021. Um, but I want to revisit it because I think it's so interesting and it really gets to the, the crux of what we're doing. And there's so much going on now with glyphosate. Um, and, you know, is there enough proof that there is um, problems with the amount on our crops that would cause cancer? Or is it, you know, a lot of fear mongering? There's a lot of equivocation that I want to study with you. Um, because again, if our job is to eat more vegetables and more plant-based, well, we're going to pick the fresh eggplant and we're going to see that the eggplant has genetic modification, but it was absolutely so critical for helping the industry in Haiti because their whole economy would have died if they didn't have the eggplant. Just like in Hawaii, if we didn't save the papaya, the, the huge industry in Hawaii would have died. But having GMO, so genetically modified fruit, or um, um, eggplant, now we've got this fantastic product. And just because it kills a bug, does it mean that it's going to kill humans? So there's a lot of things we don't know. Also, what you studied in 2021 may not be the same in 2023. That's why it's time to look at it again. You know, that's why I love to be on it. Because if I'm going to teach you to not buy too many packaged foods, and the packaged foods that we do buy, I want you to be able to look at it and go, Okay, three factors. What's it, who's it selling to? So the front of pack. Look at the nutrition facts. What's it matter to me? Proteins, carbs, fats, maybe sodium. And then to qualify everything, I'm going to look down at the ingredient list so that I can make sure my packaged food is making sense to me. Because the great example of the Miracle Whip and the other mayonnaise is, is 
you can't look in one spot and get all, all the info that you need. And when we start looking at uh, genetically modified vegetables, they're not going to have a label. It's going to be sort of hidden. Do you remember, we're all old enough to probably be uh, around when the tomato was the first uh, product that came to market that had some genetic modification. Now, I'm in California, so maybe it was much more advertised there, but I know we get tomatoes here probably from Mexico, but um, it was a big deal. I think it was in 84. And it was a big deal because it was the first to hit the market. And now what's really becoming more and more common is GMO salmon. Um, and, I, and I kind of alluded to this about a year ago. Very soon, our salmon will be completely created in the lab. It will never be a wild, and doesn't it seem weird, Paula? It's like, gosh, do we eat it? <laughs> and so we have to try to think, okay, just because it's unfamiliar doesn't mean it's bad. And also to keep all of our, um, our wits about us to make decisions with the best information we can. And so, you know, learning from um, organizations that are grassroots scientists that are trying to help us is important. But even when I was doing the class, um, I went through several different uh, expert opinions, you know, doctors on YouTube or, or other places on the internet, and they would be skewed. And so you know that you're going to get skewed information. And so you want to get as much as you can then to make your own decision. Because um, I'm not convinced uh, one way or the other. I know in general what I do is I buy very few products that have a lot of ingredients. That's why when I was eating those pretzels, I was looking at them and, oh my gosh, it had a lot of things in there. And then lo and behold, at the bottom it said trace amounts of bioengineered foods. So yeah, I had this little twinge of, okay, what did I just put in my body? Right? It was very little. Right. And so it, it, that was my mind. I'm like, I'm going to eat them because I didn't pack enough other stuff. And so I feel like we, we need to have a good process of decision making. Um, but, you know, as soon as I got home, I couldn't wait to eat some vegetables because that's what I was so lacking in my travels. And uh, then our fear is, well, does the vegetables have glyphosate left over, you know, the, the herbicides? And then are there pesticides there? There's many pesticides that come up through the soil and into the plant itself mm -hmm. so that if a bug eats on the corn or the eggplant, uh, it'll kill the bug because of what's inside the eggplant. And so, you know, our fear is, well, is that gonna hurt us? And so in this world of lots of uh, farming practices evolving, um, you know, they're not always in the news, just like Tucker says, you know, we don't always get to hear news that we necessarily care about. Um, so we have to dig, we have to ask and, and search and, and find information that helps us make the best decisions we can. And all the while, I think not being, um, fear-mongering, um, and so we want to just be um, as prudent as we can. So now I want you to look at the products you have, and I want you to um, tell me about the products. So in our last few minutes, I want us to identify, so given the criteria that I've just mentioned, and that is um, what's the front of pack telling us, so who's the customer, and then we're going to qualify it by looking at the nutrition information, and we won't have time to do all of the products, but let's do at least a few of them, and um, we can decide if it's a product that deserves to go in our basket. Now, I know, I know, there are already ingredients, there are already items that I have in Powerhouse Bakery. <laughs> this is not really Greek yogurt because it has added Oh, it has dry milk powder. Yes. Oh, wow. Good point. So it's the purpose of mine is to eat the Greek yogurt. It's just, you know, it is real good with a lot of added milk powder or something. Wow. Added yeah. stuff. Yeah. Okay, so let's go through the process. So, Seema, on the front of pack, who is that yogurt being marketed to? Somebody who wants to eat a lot of protein and protein. Yes, yes, you're exactly right. So this is looking for somebody that wants lots of protein. Oops, P-R-O, and no fat. So that's what they care about. And it's so interesting that on that one, it's not organic. It's not real, right? And so it's is appealing to the general population with a broad brush stroke of people that have been taught these big bullet points that more the more protein the better and the least fat the better. And it has no sugar. It has no sugar. Yeah. So these are one of the few brands that has the lowest sugar. It's six grams or five grams of sugar. 
Yeah. Yeah. I always thought if it was not a lot of fat, they put a lot of sugar in it to make Sometimes that's true. That's sometimes true. Now this, this one all the natural sugars converted to lactic acid. So yeah. That's why the sugar content is there. Yeah. So it's a broad brush stroke of people. Now if if we were looking for organic, we wouldn't pick that one up. Is there another yogurt that somebody's holding that's organic? The coconut yogurt and also the forager. Okay. And the title Forager Project is right Yes. The Forager Project. Yes. Well, and that's what we're trying to decide on right now is what's the best. So the qualifier is what does. Not best tasty, but what's the best yogurt? And so it depends. And that's what we're trying to decide. It depends. Now the forager and the coconut yogurt alternatives, mm -hmm. it's best if what? If you have a dairy allergy. Mm -hmm. So if you do forager or what was the other one called? That's the H-E-B brand, right? Coconut yogurt. Plant-based. This one's the best if you need dairy free, right? It, has, it does have added uh, probiotics. Okay, so we know that if it's a yogurt, it should have probiotics added, right? Mm -hmm. It should have light lactobacillus. Exactly. It should, did, did yours, the Greek yogurt, have? Okay, good. So they both qualify as yogurt. And the, now let's look at the protein levels. This is, to me, a smoking gun. The protein levels of the forager. What's that one? Three grams. Three grams. And how much was this one? This is 17 grams. 17 grams, oh, right? Same size. Yeah, same serving size. So now the, the question will be, well, which one's better? Well, it depends. Are you looking for a food that needs to go into your protein category or somewhere else? Yes, that's so right. So you pick this one when you need to have dairy-free. So this becomes your qualifier versus protein. So if you're going to use your yogurt as your protein serving, but you need to have the dairy-free one, are you going to miss getting protein in that meal? Yeah. yeah, of course. So now, now the question will be, well, where can we, how do we add protein to that meal? Because now we're just really adding carbs, right? If you're using a yogurt that is dairy-free, made, made by coconut or almond, some chia seeds. There we go. High five. And, uh, exactly. Nice. Yes. Mighty seeds. You're so right, Shirley. So it doesn't mean it's a deal breaker. And so the question will be, well, which one's healthier? Well, it depends. And it depends on how you serve it. So if you serve it with all those wonderful seeds in there, did you get your protein up? Oh, yeah. And did you get your minerals and fiber and all other things too? Yeah. So... You could feasibly be even better off with this one if you added stuff to it. Now, if you didn't, you'd be lacking protein, right? So that's, that's where I feel like it's so important to know where are you going to use it and what makes it healthy. It depends on you. So if you have an intolerance, then you automatically take this one out because it's messing you up. Well, this one isn't good either because it only has one gram of protein, oh, wow. 15 grams of uh, added sugar. Um, seven grams of fat. Seven grams of fat. So, um, Cecilia, what makes this one bad, though? Well, it doesn't have enough protein if you want. But Shirley gave us a suggestion on how to fix that. Okay. The added sugar. The added sugar. Now let's look at the ingredients and see what sugar they used. Because what if they used coconut sugar? Would we still say, oh, okay, I'll so consider it. milk and cream, but they also add cane sugar. And is it not organic? It doesn't yeah, so eh, not so good, right? It becomes a detractor. Now, again, we go back to our original decision. It's like, well, I need to use this because it's in a recipe. And the recipe is, you know, I only do it once a year. You know, you can kind of decide, is it something I'm still never going to use? And that answer might be yes, because we've sworn off all of cane sugar. Does yeah. Does it even have any probiotics? Like good question. Yes, that one does? So probiotics. And they are the second to final ingredient. Mm -hmm. And then it also says on the front, 50% of the 
daily um, amount of B12. Hey. So the last ingredient on this. Now, then you bring up a whole nother component, and that's so cool. Does yours show the B12 too, Shirley, the forager? All right, and it has a USDA label. And Celia, yours did not have a USDA label, right? Ah, so now we have to decide. Do we want um, B12 or do we want um, USDA organic? So again, what makes it healthy? What makes it a good choice? Do we want it to be organic or do we want B12? Wow. B12 says somebody? B12 if you're vegetarian. Maybe so, right? But if you're getting your seeds, now you just got a big jolt of B12. But if you're not taking B12, or if you're low in intrinsic factor and you're already taking a, a sublingual B12, doesn't matter because I like this one better, you know? And so, gosh, there's so many ways to decide what is the healthiest yogurt to pick. And same thing with the nut butters um, and the butters. So, so I've got, you've got earth balance that you're looking at and um, we've got cashew butter, sun butter. And, you know, so I love that we've got products that front a pack, give you good information, and then you get to decide in the ingredient list and the macronutrients if it's going to match what you consider is your healthiest choice. Yeah, and the bottom line, right? If it doesn't taste good, why bother? You can also adjust your taste. And don't we all do that? I mean, when I first ate plain yogurt, I thought, whew, that is hard to like, right? And now I actually love Bulgarian plain. So My husband still have, doesn't. Because it has one of the few yogurts that has only milk and lactobacillus. That's it. Right, but it's not organic. It's sour. It's very sour. But the White Mountain, which I love and, and I buy, exactly what I but it's not organic. So that kind of makes me go, oh, darn, you know, it's not perfect. Um, so just in closing, I want to do one more. Um, I have not found a Bulgarian organic. Has anybody? They might. Maybe they, and I just haven't found it because I, I get the White Mountain, it's in a jar. And yes, um, yeah, I, love the jars. I do too. I reuse them. They do? Okay, cool. Well, then that's good. Um, let's do one more product before we have to um, end. Um, we can either do the Tofuti or the Earth Balance. Let's do the butter. Is that okay? Because it's something that we all, I think, can appreciate in our house having butter. And now we're going to do a uh, real butter versus vegan butter. Real versus vegan. So um, look at your, does it, let's see, go ahead and read to us the front of pack information. So we're going to decide who are they trying to market it to. Certified vegan. Okay. So vegan, what else? Uh, of course, uh, verified non-GMO. Non-GMO. Soy free. Soy free. Gluten free. Gluten free. They're getting a lot of subpopulations, right? Zero trans fats. Woo, zero trans fats. Oh, I like how it says made with a hint of olive oil. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's Even pulling nice. in the olive oil people, right? Mm -hmm. E V O O. Does it say organic? And this is a funny story. I don't know if you guys have shopped at HEB this week. Maybe it was last week. There was a dollar off coupon. And I bought seven of these. And it said for the Earth Balance butter. And it said all varieties. And I got it up there and I was all excited because I was going to save $7 because I bought seven of them. And the guy's like, oh, no, 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 no. It was only for the organic one. And I'm like, what? They all said. And it just so happened that the one I picked didn't say organic. That was so frustrating because I thought I was going to save $7 and I had to pay regular price. And so Earth Balance, there's several varieties. One has olive oil, one is soy-free, and I guess one of them is organic. Go figure. I noticed that it says olive oil, real big, but then when you turn it around, it's just a hint. Yes, that's a really good point. got three other... Big call-outs, big yeah. call-outs. And so again, when they have all these lifestyle components, yeah. those are small subpopulations, and they pay a lot of money to get those on there. I promise you that's so expensive. And then it, it casts a wider net because 
you know, all these people. And then, you know, this little trick where it didn't have organic on that one they had on the sale, you know, got me because I thought, well, surely it's, they're all organic, <laughs> but they weren't. Um, so that's the front of pack. Now, if we're going to compare it to butter, now let's look at the nutrition facts. And let's look at what, um, let's look at the serving size. Serving size, one tablespoon. One tablespoon. Gives us how many calories? 80. 80 calories. And how many fats? Uh, 9 grams of total fat and 2.5 of saturated fat. 2.5 of sat fat. Oh, and it has 2 polyunsaturated fat. Okay. And 4 monosaturated fats. 4 monounsaturated fats. Mm. So poofas and mufas. So just my little abbreviation. <laughs> um, polyunsaturated fatty acids and monounsaturated fatty acids. Um, Mary Jonas, would you get me a, a, one of those containers of butter that's right by you? We were just packing that ice chest. Um, so now let's look at um, any other ingredients that we care about. We know that a, a butter, is it going to give us any protein? Thank you. No, uh, like a cube of butter, like the real butter? No. Nope. So what about, what else would we care about in, in a butter? Salt. Okay, how much salt? Is that a lot? Thank you so much. That's perfect. Um, how much salt should we have in a day? Is 75 a lot or a little? A teaspoon or so? I don't know how. So if we, if we know that when we're looking at salt and we know that a five, um, five grams of a day is a low sodium diet. That's 2,000 milligrams of sodium. Right. So five grams a day. So that's very small, right? We can just put it in context. Sometimes when we see a sodium number, we, we, we don't really know what to think of it. Okay. So if it, it doesn't have any f um, fiber. It doesn't have any protein. Can you think of any other fats that do? If we're just as an offshoot here, we're looking at butter, I know, but, but you know, because we're health nuts and we're pretty smart, if we wanted to replace butter, with something that was also vegan, non-GMO, soy-free, gluten-free, and no trans fats. What could we put on our toast? Avocado. Yes, absolutely. What else? Nut butters. And nut butters would in fact give us some protein and some fiber, which is why I love it when, you know, you could add butter, sure, but what if you also added a little bit of almond butter? So, you know, and then, and then the vegan world, they say, gosh, it's so hard to get enough protein. No, it's not. Everything you add to your meal could have protein in it. You just have to know what to pick, right? Okay, so now we're going to compare this to real butter. Um, so in one tablespoon, there is 100 calories. And so I'm going to put, um, I'll put it up here. I'll put it over here. Real butter. 100 calories versus 80 and fat grams instead of 9 11 grams of fat and sodium this happens to be unsalted so zero sodium and what else do we need to look at that's it really so if we said what's the best butter we would say, gosh, well, what are we comparing it to? And how do we determine what's best? We might say, gosh, well, maybe this one's better because it's lower in total calories. Not or many. not that many, right? Mm -hmm. I know that's, that's your brain working. What about fat grams? Now, if you say, gosh, I only get 20 grams of fat for my whole day, which is way too low. Um, it would, it would matter, you know, only two grams here and there would add up, but nine grams versus 11. And they break this down. Now, real butter does have a little bit of um, polyunsaturates and monounsaturates. Seven of these are saturated versus two of these. So it definitely has higher saturated fat, which is why butter kind of has a bad reputation. But those of us that like butter, I've decided that I'm going to use this and get my healthy fat ratio. Because if I don't eat any animals, I am getting a little bit of saturated fat here. Unless I wanted it to be vegan, that butter is just as good as this butter. Um, is this one soy free? Yeah, it sure is. Is it non-GMO? Well, uh, it depends on what we're looking at as far as um, brands. 
but we can rest assured that it doesn't say anywhere on here that there is um, some bioengineered trace amounts found. And again, there's a lot we aren't knowing about how they're raising the cow. This is not organic. So technically, the cow could have eaten some genetically modified corn, which could have gotten into their fat, which could have gotten into the butter. But it's not being told on here because um, they don't really have to when the ingredient is a single ingredient. Technical, right? Um, does it have gluten? No. Does it have trans fats? No, it doesn't. Good thought though. Because it's just an animal product, there's one ingredient, they did not have to add any um, emulsifiers or um, you know things, products that would help it to stay together. So no, it doesn't have any trans fats. Yeah, now if here's another caveat. If you heat butter, um, do, do you get more acrylamide? Do you get more um, cyclamines, which are cancer causing? Yes. Because, so you don't want to burn butter. You don't want to heat it to high temperatures. That's why whenever I teach you guys about, um, you know, your cooking technique, you don't want the skillet to get hot slowly with the fat in there because it breaks it down. So technique comes into play too. Um, and, you know, of course, this doesn't have any EVOO, but who cares because we can eat our, we can use our olive oil somewhere else. Um, but if somebody, you know, really used this as a, a deciding factor, um, who was, who made the point? It's just a tiny bit. Yeah, very small amount. Okay, does this help? Yeah. It's really interesting, right, to kind of put all the pieces together and see how do you decide what is the healthiest food to eat. So thank you for joining me. Love you guys. Yay.